to do. But one day I'll be rewarded with a crown so bright and new. I'll wear a smile so bright for there'll be no cause for a frown. When I'm rolled and Lord, I want to mention Oh, your hand a crown and glory day Come, we'll always forever let your throne Around. Lord, please reserve the mansion to rule. Amen. Good morning, Noda Church. Good morning, family. To those online and to those physically present at the Johnston Y, please connect with our members online. The website is made available just to say hello and extend kindness to, to one another. Next slide. Uh, for the benefit of those that are visiting us, uh, this is our format for children's classes. And if you so desire at the appropriate time uh, when we dismiss our children, please do so as you feel comfortable. Uh, this next slide talks about the YMCA parking. We're all familiar with that by now. If you plan to stay beyond the worship time, make sure you register your vehicle up front. We don't want anyone to get towed. And with our church updates, uh, we're in constant prayer all the time, but especially at the 11 o'clock hour where we're collectively praying for our new, new changes and transitions as we're going through. And we're also asking everyone to, to incorporate fasting on Wednesdays. Um, our site search team is continuing to meet and to look at uh, opportunities for us going forward. And shortly we'll be getting some updates on that. Next slide. We are still in need for volunteers for the nursery. And as you see the information listed, please uh, reach out to those individuals if you're able to do so. Before we get into our main prayer this morning, where's Cindy? Cindy's gonna make an announcement about the prayer vigil. And when she finishes her announcement, we'll have opening prayer by Brother Joe. Thank you, Donald. 300 years ago in Saxony, Germany, a small church began a prayer vigil that lasted for 100 years. Then one of the leaders of that church was named Count Zinzendorf, and that prayer vigil has become famous for the length that it went on. In two weeks, our church will have our second prayer vigil. We've already had one. But on July 29th, it will start at 11 a.m. That's a Saturday, and we'll go till Sunday, the next day, at 11 a.m. So if those guys in Saxony, Germany, 300 years ago, could do it for 100 years, we can do it for 24 hours. So please, please sign up for one of the slots. It's easy to do. It's, you can sign up for half an hour or an hour. You don't have to be in the church to do it. You can even be on vacation when you do it. I know that Amanda Floyd, is Amanda here today? Yeah, she did it in the car on the way from a photography shoot for us. So you can do it anywhere. And Debbie Vanderbeek sends out a prayer guide to, for us to use, and that's very helpful. So it's not hard to do. And even if you signed up last time, please sign up again. We need all the people we can. And Debbie says if we get completely full, she'll make a second one so we can have two people an hour praying. The focus of this one, and this is the last thing I'm going to say, is primarily, again, our relocation efforts and finding a new minister. But it's also a focus of this second prayer vigil is for Aaron and Ryan's family and Elsie and Josie. So... If you can make time to pray for them, that would be great. I'm sure they would appreciate it. And they're going through a big transition. And Ryan has done so much for us. So please make sure you pray for him, even if you're not in the prayer vigil. But please be in the prayer vigil. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. At this time, let us go to God in prayer. And we're going to ask Brother Joe to come forward and lead us in that prayer this morning.
Please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this morning, Lord, for the time that we have together, Lord, to gather in unity at your table with one another, Lord, for this church, for our fellowship with one another. Lord, thank you for your grace, for your salvation, um, for giving us that grace and salvation today, for each and every day that we've had on this earth, and for, Lord willing, the future days that we have on this earth. Lord, for as Paul wrote to the Ephesians, um, even as, as he was lower than the least of these, he was given grace and salvation, Lord, and we know that we have been given grace and salvation. Lord, your love, your your compassion for us, no matter what we do, our transgressions, our sins, um, our battles, our celebrations, our, our wins in this life, our thanks to you, Lord. Um, our freedom from those transgressions and sins are, are thanks to you, Lord. Lord, please be with every member of this church um, that we gather together in celebration and unity um, for, those, for those earthly gains that we have. Lord, but also thank you for each and every one of us, um, for prayers, for, for love, for compassion towards one another, um, to help us get through the challenging times that we, that we go through. Lord, especially today, we're, we're thankful for uh, the leadership of this church, for, for Ryan, for the, the service that him, is, him and his family is, has given us the last seven years. Um, we pray, Lord, that, that you're with him today in his message and um, that it is true to your word and may we, may we all benefit uh, from, from his message today. Lord, thank you for, for the children of this church. Please continue to be with them. Please continue to be with the parents uh, of those children, Lord, to, to raise them and to help grow your church and your kingdom in this earth. Lord, thank you so much for the service members here and abroad that are sacrificing so much to protect us and allow us to worship you freely without persecution. Lord, also please be with those troops and service members in other parts of the world, Lord, that are fighting for you, that are fighting for the ability to, to worship and to free those who are unable to worship um, you freely and without persecution. Lord, in our daily battles, please also be with us as we put on God's armor that we can proclaim the truth through studying your word, through these services, through songs, through prayer, um, and Lord, deliver that message to others as well, whether it's directly or indirectly through our actions or words. Lord, please be with this church as we uh, go through a time of transition. May we... Um, utilize this, this transition, Lord, and uh, whether it's our new building or new church leadership, to, to utilize those gifts that you've given us. Lord, we each have individual gifts that um, we've been blessed with, and may each of us step up and, and pray and think about how we can utilize those gifts to benefit the church and the community and, and your kingdom overall. Lord, please be with us today. Um, not only today, but also each and every day this week, uh, as we're together, as we're apart, to pray for one another, to know each other's needs, and just to know that we are um, always loving one another and always praying for one another. In your Son, Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Brother Joe, for that beautiful prayer. Poor brother. Good morning again, everyone. Um, let me say, I'm thankful for each one of you. I'm thankful for each one of you. I'm thankful for our church leadership because God's word tells us where there is no vision, the people perish, right? And it's easy for us as members to come and expect things to stay the same. But this morning, we got to change. So we get to look at each other across the aisle this morning. Nobody can go to sleep, right? Uh, but, Ryan, thank you for setting this up this way. Uh, I trust and pray that we'll still lift our voices this morning. I hope that I'm not in the way as you're looking at the, at the PowerPoint slide. 
But uh, let God have his way with you this morning. And if you're so able, let us stand. Let's worship God this morning. Uh, we're going to start with reciting John 14, 15 through 21. If you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him. He lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me because I live you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. Amen. We're going to transition into our first song, second song this morning. My hope is built on nothing less. My hope is built on nothing, nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When darkness fails, his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. His oath, his cover, net his blood, the port me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, my sin is all my hope and stay on Christ. Rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, but let's to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is thinking sand. All other ground is thinking sand. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore I will hope in him. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore I will hope in him. Therefore I will hope. Amen. Please remain standing for the reading of God's word. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 through 21. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. 
that is, the mystery made known to me by revelation, as I have already written briefly. In reading this, then, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to people in other generations as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise in, G in Christ Jesus. I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. Although I am less than the least of all the Lord's people, this grace was given to me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God who created all things. His intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms, according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. In him, and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. I ask you, therefore, not to be discouraged because of my sufferings for you, which are your glory. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know that this love sur that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. And at this time, we will dismiss our children to children's classes. Hide me away, O oh Lord. Hide me away, O oh Lord. Oh, in the day of trouble, neath the shadow of your wings. Hide me away, O oh Lord. Give me your peace, O oh Lord. Give me your peace, O oh Lord. Give me your peace, O oh Lord. Oh, in the day of trouble, neath the shadow of your wings, give me your peace, O oh Lord. Give me your peace, O oh Lord. Safe in your dwelling place. Safe in your dwelling place. In the day of trouble, neath the shadow of your wings, hide me away, O oh Lord. Hide me away, O oh Lord. Hide me away, O oh Lord. As the deep thirst for the water, Lord, so my soul longs after you. My soul. Thirst for the living God. Yes, my soul longs after you. And I pour out thoughts deep within me. Deep within me, I pour out my soul. Draw me deeper, Lord, deeper, Lord, in you. Draw me deeper, Lord, deeper, Lord, in you. As the deep thirst 
for the water, Lord. So my soul longs after you. My soul thirsts for the living God. Yes, my soul longs after you. And I pour out my soul deep within me, deep within me. I pour out my soul. Draw me deeper, Lord, deeper, Lord, in you. Draw me deeper, Lord. Deeper, Lord, in you. And I pour up my deep within me. Deep within me, I pour out my soul. Draw me deeper, Lord. In you, draw me deeper, Lord, deeper, Lord, in you, and I pour out my soul deep within me. Draw me deeper, Lord, deeper, Lord, in you. Draw me deeper, Lord, deeper, Lord, in you. And I pour out my soul deep within me. church. Good morning to everyone to the left of me and good morning to everyone to the right of me. I know this is a little awkward and that's okay. You know, when you think about the structure of, a, of an assembly, um, a lot of the things we believe and a lot of the things we feel and a lot of the things we're convicted of are more caught than taught. Uh, what we do on a regular basis actually shapes how we think and feel uh, about everything. Um, so a lot of times, most of the time, we, we actually focus our chairs up here, and we rarely look at one another. And the idea of this, and I, I love the intentionality that Stimmy has actually uh, leaned into this, that we've moved our scripture reading to the back, so the focus is not on the one who's reading, but on the words that are being proclaimed. And when you when you spend all your time looking up here, we've we've actually placed the communion table as the focal point of our church. So that every act of worship is focused on the one thing that, that really matters for why we're here, and it's to break bread together to proclaim the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And so this morning, we wanted to have a moment to look at one another, uh, to think of it this way, to look through the table at the people that we gather with. That while our focus is on worshiping God, uh, we do so in a way that is supposed to bring us together and unite us. 
And so the simple act of moving our chairs to where they face one another helps us to think about who we worship with as we proclaim the one we worship. And so this is a this isn't not just a changing of seating, but a, uh, a, a an intentional focus on a certain theology of the church. That we want to embody what God has called us to be, or who God has called us to be. Uh, for the last few weeks, I've been focusing on unity and, and what it means to be unified as the church, as a proclamation of God's gospel to the world. And I want to I want to end that study with a focus on the table. I want to share a story uh, called Babette's Feast. And this is a story uh, that it was a movie back in the 80s based off of a book from the 50s, but it takes place uh, in the 1800s during the um, French Civil War. I'm trying to remember. feels like there's a lot of those, um, you know, because they're French. But, but this, is a, this is a story about um, Babette's Feast. And the basic story is in, in this little town in what is now Denmark, um, on, the, on the coast, there's a little Christian community. And this Christian community was dying, and, and there's, uh, there's these two women uh, who were running this Christian community. Their, their father was the one who founded it. And as a group of Christians that uh, were very pious and very strict on their life together. And as the community was dying off, uh, they continued to serve those around them, to provide uh, meager meals as an act of service for the people in their surrounding community. And they're very pious and very uh, focused on what it meant to be Christians. And then one day, this woman named Babette showed up at their door. Uh, she was a refugee from Paris during uh, the Civil War, and she was seeking refuge. And she knocked on the door uh, looking for someone to take her in, and they said, well, we can't pay you anything. She said, I will work for free if you'll just let me live here. And so for 14 years, she made a very simple meal for the community and to serve the community around them. And every Every day, she would make these very simple meals, and, and all she got in return was a bed to sleep in and enough food to survive on. So for 14 years, this young woman was part of this aging community, and she served this community. And then one day, she found out she had uh, a winning lottery ticket. Um, and everybody in this community assumed that Babette was going to be on her way out the door. She's been living in poverty. She's been living, uh, just barely surviving with what she was eating. And she, uh, they believed that she would be on the first train back to Paris. But instead, she sends to Paris for the finest foods, the finest wines, china and crystal. She plans and prepares an extravagant feast for the little band of religious folk on the occasion of the 100th anniversary of the birth of their founder. But they're a very puranical, they're a very pious group, and they didn't want to indulge in such a feast. And so they knew that they needed to go to the feast and show hospitality because she is providing this for them. But they, they all got together and said, we refuse to enjoy it. Sometimes we can be pious like that. And so she, she made this great feast and they refused to enjoy it and they dared not enjoy it. Um, but she made this huge meal. And as they gathered around this table, and they put this table down the center street of their village, and everybody was invited to come to the table. And she cooked this meal, and as they ate the meal, you could see the mood starting to change, because it was impossible not to enjoy it. We have some people in our congregation who know how to cook that can change the mood of people. You've, you've probably seen this happen, that as they enjoy, I mean, I, I, I'm okay at cooking, but when I have your food, it changes my mood. 
And so there's this meal down the middle of the village where everybody, they're, they're trying to keep their pious look about them. But as they indulge in this feast, the mood starts to change. People who were in conflict with each other started looking across the table and enjoying the celebration despite themselves. Uh, a visiting nephew of the community uh, who was a military officer, he was well-schooled, had traveled the world with the military, had spent time in Paris, and he began to recognize that the food was from the most prestigious restaurant in Paris. And as he ate the food, he started to ask questions, and it turned out that the person who had been cooking for them for 14 years was the chef of the most prestigious restaurant in Paris. And now that she had the opportunity to really provide for them, she cooked them the best meal of their lives. She spent every dime to provide a feast. And what happened in this feast is they realized her true identity, the whole feel of the community changed because they had a reason to celebrate, that they looked at this person that they saw as a charity case who had actually invested in this community and wanted to give back to it, had given them a gift that they could never give themselves, and they realized she truly loves us. And as they realized that this meal was such a gift from her labor of love, from her heart, and every dime she had won, they began to transform how they looked at one another, and, and old fights started going away as they broke bread and drank wine and celebrated the glory of being in community together. I, I love the idea of this movie and, and the basic synopsis of it because it is a picture of the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist. And when I look at the, the stories of, of the Lord's Supper, my favorite story is this. In Luke chapter uh, 24, you have these two disciples of Jesus walking down the road. And as they walk down the road, uh, Jesus joins them, but they have no idea that Jesus is with them. They do not recognize the person that is with them. And they have a dialogue about everything that had gone on in Jerusalem, and they, they began to tell Jesus about the one who was crucified. And what I love about this passage, uh, they invited him, they urged him strongly in verse 29 to stay with them. In verse 30, it says, this is Luke chapter 24, verse 30, it says, uh, when Jesus was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Uh, that that sentence is what is called a, a Eucharistic model. That when you see uh, take, give thanks, and break, and then give, it's supposed to draw your mind to the table. That this common meal that they're having is now the Lord's Supper. Uh, you see this also as an example in, in the Gospel of John where Jesus is feeding the 5,000. Jesus takes, give, gives thanks, breaks, and distributes. The whole feast of 5,000 is seen as a Lord's Supper feast. And so Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. And it's in the breaking of bread and in the drinking of wine that in verse 31 it says, then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. And then they asked each other, were our hearts, uh, were not our hearts burning within us while we walked and talked on the road with him? And he opened the scriptures to us. And then they got up and returned all the way back to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and said, It is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told them what happened on the way. 
and how Jesus has rec- is recognized by them when he broke the bread. When I look at the church and I see the struggles of bringing people together uh, from different backgrounds, from different lifestyles, from different cultural uh, upbringings, from different you know, social statuses, from different genders, from different, all the differences we have, we are brought together as one in Christ. Uh, over, over the last two weeks, I've, I've focused on this in the book of Ephesians, how, uh, how God has brought us together as one new humanity where the dividing wall of hostility between Jew and Gentile has been torn down so that they can come together as one. And the whole point of the church is that God has, um, God has, has created a world-changing social experiment. That when you think about what the church is supposed to be, this is God's experiment to show the world what it looks like when you can bring people together as one where the world says divide between these groups, to have different guilds, to have different backgrounds, to have different clubs, to God says, no, we're going to do something different. We're going to bring all people together as one in Christ Jesus. So there's neither slave nor free. There's neither Jew nor Gentile. There's neither male nor female. This is you know, Galatians 3. Where it says, we are all one in Christ Jesus, who are baptized into Christ. We have, put, we have clothed ourselves with Christ. And so when we look at one another, we look through the table, and in the breaking of bread, we see Christ in one another. And the struggle of the church is that so often our identities get in the way of coming to the table fully. That I have identities in my life that I then see people that have a different identity that it puts me in tension with them. And sometimes it's hard to come to the table knowing that they're going to be there also. And there's identities that each of us put on that come into conflict or come into tension with our identity in Christ. Uh, It could be your maleness or your femaleness. That we live in a time where it's, you know, one group oppresses the other group to then rise themselves up. And we live in a time where it's like, well, it feels like they're oppressing us, so we need to get the upper hand to oppress them. So it could be, uh, it could be your ethnicity. It could be your social status. It could be your economics. There are different things that you put on. It could be your politics. There are different things that you take on in your identity that is hard to reconcile with someone else's identity. And when we come to the table, it's in the breaking of bread that we then look through the table to see Christ in the other, to then allow that identity to be removed and the identity of our sisterhood and brotherhood to come together as one new humanity. So whether you're an American or a Canadian, whether you're black, you're white, whether you have a Christian background since your birth or you came to Christ later in life, whether you're Jew or Gentile, slave or free, in the breaking of bread, we remember our baptisms and that we've been clothed with Christ. And we have to continue to go back into the water sometimes to allow our identity to be washed clean, to challenge who we are, to remind us of our true identity in Christ. And so in this world-changing social experiment, I want to give three things. Um, This is my last sermon, so I'm going to do something I've never done and give three points. I just realized that, so maybe I'll find a fourth one just to change it up. Got to be consistent. Uh, The first is that we approach one another with grace. That in how we look at one another, when you look across this room and you see one another, you look at people who have received the same grace in Jesus Christ as you. 
And if you've received grace, you then approach others with grace. And this gospel of yes, where God says yes to each of us through the grace of Jesus Christ, we then approach one another with grace. Well, what if they're conservative? What if they're liberal? What if they're woke? What if they're stuck in the mud? We put all kinds of labels on one another that allows us to dehumanize one another. And we fail to ever see one another. And so when we approach each other with grace, we recognize that we have been transformed in Christ and been made new. And each of us comes to this table by the same grace to offer the same grace. Now, the second is this. We approach one another with love. These may seem obvious, but we don't define love in the way that Webster defines love. And we don't define love in the way that the world defines love. We define love in the way that Christ defines love who, being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing, becoming like us, becoming obedient, becoming a slave, and becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. That in the way that Jesus shows love to us, he meets us not just where we are, but allows himself to become a servant of who we are. And so we, we, we approach one another through grace with love. And I love the way um, Scott McKnight writes this. He says that, we, that the love of Christ that we approach one another with, with is this. We have a rugged commitment to be with And we have a commitment to each other. And we have a commitment for each other. And we have a commitment unto each other. And so these these descriptors, these these action um, prepositions, uh, we have a rugged commitment to be with, to, for, and unto, that we, we live life in such a way that we're so focused on the other that so often the world says, well, they need to come this way a little bit first. But the love of Christ says, how can I go the full extent and meet you here so that we can then walk together? So often we wait for them to take the first step, but to be unified as a body of Christ, we have to go the full extent. We have to walk right past the table to where people are, picking up the bread, breaking it, and revealing our identity together. And finally, the third thing, um, actually, I want to I add this. Uh, when we talk about loving one another, we have a tendency to be judgmental because we have, um, we have a level of expectation of others. And we, we should have expectations, but it's what we do with those expectations and how we demonize uh, others with those expectations that becomes dangerous that love allows us not to be judgmental. I really like um, Henry Nouwen in The Way of the Heart. He says, in order to die to our neighbors, it means we must stop judging them, to stop evaluating them, and thus to become free to be compassionate. Compassion can never coexist with judgment because judgment creates the distance the distinction which prevents us from really being with the other. So often when we approach others, we've already come with a wall up. And the the third thing, the third action that I want to offer us is the, the action of breaking bread together. That when we come to the table, we recognize that we come together as a family. Uh, While you can figure out how to take communion by yourself and individualize it, so so often we've made communion an individual endeavor, but this is a communal meal 
where we all gather around this table. And, and this table represents every table that Christ has ever sat at and every table that Christians have sat at since. And, and when Scripture is looking at the table, uh, Scripture is actually looking towards the great banquet in heaven where all people come together, uh, the saints of old, the saints of today, and the saints of tomorrow, all people who are in Christ come together at this table, and we see all things new, we see all things as they are. And the table reorients our relationships in this great celebration of who Jesus is and who we're called to be in Christ. And so the regular practice of breaking bread together brings us around this table and calls us to, to tear off all things that divide us and take up our one true identity in Christ. And so when we, when we practice breaking bread together, we practice being the church. And this is my hope for this church that just like Babette's feast that reoriented all relationships into this new celebration because they recognized the great chef who brought the food to the table, that this church, as we move forward into a new season, will recognize the one who always sets the table is Christ. And no matter what happens, no matter what trials come, that this table is a table that is always returned to, to reorient us as to who we are. And my prayer for you is this. It's the prayer of Paul in Ephesians chapter 3, that as you do life together and you break bread together, you come to know the love of Christ. So I want to end uh, with the words of Paul, and then I want to give us some instructions as to what's next. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through the Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide, how long, how high, and how deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. I, I pray that this church will come to know increasingly the love of God. It's 11 o'clock, so I'm going to pray. Father, we, we love you, and as we've gathered every day, uh, and wherever we are, we've gathered to pray for this church, for the transitions we're in, for the journey that we're on, and for the people of this way. God, we pray that your spirit of peace will move through us, in us, around us, and into the future for us to prepare a way that we may walk. God, I pray that we will be rooted and established in love, that we may know the depth of the love of Christ, and that we may be filled to the measure of all fullness that we have in you because of the depths of love that we've explored. God, may this church be a witness to your love. And we end this prayer with the words of Paul, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. As we prepare to break bread together, uh, I want to encourage you, challenge you, implore you, urge you to take a moment of reflection. As you think about your identity, 
who you are, the things that you hold up as great in your life, the things that you think, okay, I wish people knew this most about me, or even the things that, that most define you. I want you to allow the Spirit to, to examine you and say, okay, what is it about me that could potentially keep me from being unified from others in this church. And we have uh, yellow slips of paper, and please keep these pins because we have lots of them. Um, But write down what that identity is. And we're going to, uh, we have these trays here as, as a symbolic reminder of the breaking of bread together. But during this next song, uh, this is the altar call. It's something else I don't do very often, a call to come forward. But I'm going to call all of you to come forward this morning and to lay your identity here at the altar so that when we break bread together, we are breaking bread as a reminder of who we are in Christ Jesus. I hesitate to share what I'm going to write down. But I'm going to, I'm going to share just to be vulnerable. I've spent my entire adult life pursuing education. Um, Studying God's word is is what I've dedicated my life to. As a service to the church, my whole intention was that my education would be a service to the church and for the church. But there are times in my life that I have allowed my education to become a barrier between me and others. That... In my most honest of times, there, there have been times where I've said, you know, if they were smarter, if they just understood, you know, and had the education that I have, and those are things that I have to keep in check. And so my identity as an academic uh, can sometimes become a, a burden between me and people that may not be as educated but this is where I stand with Paul, and this is where I try and keep myself in check. I want to know Christ. That's it. The power of his resurrection, to, to know Christ in a way that is transformative. I know lots of people who know lots of Bible who don't believe in God. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. And in my academic identity, sometimes I can allow myself to be, pu- to be puffed up. And so that's the identity I want to leave on the altar. Uh, while Donald comes and leads us, church, let's take a moment to, to step forward and to leave your identity here at the altar. Uh, they will not be read. I will immediately take them and they will go straight into the trash can. This is purely for you. Uh, And if you're worried about that, you can help me take them to the trash can. But Donald, come and lead us in song. Church, let's sing together. Who is like you, Lord, in all the earth? Matchless love and beauty, countless words. For nothing in this world will satisfy. Jesus, you're the cup that won't run dry. Your presence is heaven to me. Your presence is heaven to me. Treasure of my heart and of my soul. In my weakness, you are merciful. Redeemer of my past and present wrong. Holder of my future days to come. Your presence is heaven to me nothing like your presence lord your presence is heaven 
to me. O Jesus, O Jesus, your presence is heaven to me. Jesus, oh Jesus, your presence is heaven to me. Oh Jesus, oh Jesus, your presence is heaven to me. Oh Jesus, oh Jesus, your presence is heaven to me. All my days on earth I will await the moment that I see you face to face. For nothing in this world will satisfy. Jesus, you're the cup that won't run dry. Your presence is heaven to me. Your Continue to be still in the presence of God and be thinking through the things that we've heard and to focus on those things as we approach one another in grace, approach one another in love. In a moment, we'll continue to gather around the table to break bread with one another. Our reading this morning is a continuation within the third chapter, and it's in verses 14 through 21. For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's people to grasp how wide, how long, how high, 
how deep is the love of Christ. And to know that this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all of the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Let's continue in silence and be thinking of the reading that we just heard. And if there are things that are of great importance to you, feel free to share. Father, we thank you for this word. We see here this prayer from Paul to those in the church at Ephesus. And we notice the degree of prayer to which Paul takes on that not just one that is standing maybe with hands raised, but one, Father, that he gets on his knees before you to lift up that entire family because it is from you that that family derives its name. It is indeed, Father, a glorious riches to bring together that which has been torn apart for a long period of time. And Father, we're thankful that it, that is done through, not through us, but through your power and your spirit living within us that makes it all possible. May we continue to submit to you, Father, as we submit to one another. And that may love fill us beyond any measure, beyond any understanding that is of our own doing. Father, thank you for your spirit that lives within us. Thank you for that spirit of unity that is only made possible through your Son. Thank you, Father, for this table that we will continue to come around and partake of emblems, Father, in offering of a meal of restoration and reconciliation. All this we lift up before the Son, whose death on the cross makes it all possible. It's through him we pray. Amen. O oh Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary. your children to stop the fighting 
Start uniting all as one. Let's get together, loving forever. Sanctuary for you. center this morning as we prepare to take of this meal this bread and this cup and as we face one another we recognize that the table that Jesus has prepared for us is the focus and as we look at one another May that be the means by which we are unified is the table that Jesus has prepared for us. In our reading this morning, Paul had this amazing responsibility to be able to bring this mystery that for a long period of time was not clear, but now it was becoming clear that Jews and Gentiles were united in Christ. That which was possibly as far apart as anything that we could imagine in ideology and beliefs and culture. Even where Jews would not even walk into that area. All that was torn down, and Christ said, no, you're one in me. And Paul also calls us to focus on the dimensions, and we see four dimensions that he has here, of the love of Christ. 
four dimensions. What else can we think of that has four dimensions that brings us together? And it's the cross. Christ's love is so, so wide that it includes everyone. The breadth is forever. It's all eternity. It is so high that it even reaches into the heavens to restore us back to the Father and so deep that even the worst of us can be brought to the cross. So as we take this emblem, this bread, this morning, it reminds us of just what Jesus has done for us to free us. No more hostilities with one another. For if we can't forgive one another, how can we fully experience that which Christ has forgiven us? So we lay all those things down and surrender because our Lord gave up everything he had, including his life, to bring us back together to the Father. So as I pray for this, this bread, Father, may we recognize the cost that Jesus paid so we can be reconciled to you and as a result reconciled to one another. Thank you for this time of coming around the table of unity. And it's through your son we pray. Amen. And for this cup that represents Jesus' blood, the cleansing that represents, again, unity, that we've all been washed. So again, how can we have anything against one another when we have been cleansed of everything we've ever done against the Father? And he's constantly reminding us and calling us to restoration and reconciliation around this table. Thank you, Father, for this emblem that reminds us of the great sacrifice, but the cleansing that comes from your Son. We remember him in this shed blood. Thank you, Father, for this time to be together. And it's through him we pray. Amen. Brian, thanks for doing this again today. Brings back memories every time we do this, and it's wonderful to be able, the whole time I'm sitting over here, I'm looking at these people, so if you find me looking more now over this way, it's because I haven't had a chance to see all these folks. But anyway, thank you. It's a, a good time of reflection of to think um, who God is, who Jesus is, and who we are in him, and uh Definitely always a, a blessing to focus on that. Thank you for, that's been a major part of your focus over the years here. We appreciate that. Um, if you're part of the site selection team, we have a meeting afterwards up in the uh, trolley room. And uh, I think things are going to get even more exciting as uh, the, the times get closer. Um Friday night, there will be the movie on the lawn. So if you have an opportunity to come to that and serve, 
and just sharing that together with the community. That's an awesome time. That'll be Friday night. Uh, two weeks from now, we'll be having the prayer vigil, as you heard. Just really want to encourage you, be a part of that. All of us together, what a blessing to be able to just go before God to ask Him for His insight and wisdom in everything that's happening, the transitions. Um, and then Sunday is that prayer vigil for that weekend ends. We'll be having a celebration for Ryan and his years of service here and his family. And uh, we'll have a meal afterwards. And you'll get more communications about that and what that's going to entail. But we want to encourage everybody to be here for that. It'll be a great time. Let's pray. Lord, you are just an amazing God, an amazing Father. And to know that our names, our family names, are derived from you is just so beyond what we can understand. Lord, you are a God, you are sovereign, there's no other. We're just so grateful, though, that you sent us your son, Jesus, as the Messiah, the Christ, the son of the living God, to show us in a human way who you are in your divinity. Lord, and that is just awesome, and we just are so grateful for his shed blood once for all, and the grace and the mercy and the compassion and the kindness and the goodness and the righteousness and holiness that flows from that, Lord, that we would know that in greater ways. Lord, it's my prayer for this church, for each one of us, that as we seek to know you in greater ways, as we offer ourselves to you each day, as we seek to do your will, as we seek to see you work in ways that are just far beyond what we can imagine, Lord, may our testimony, may our witness, wherever we go, wherever we're at, that we would make known in these heavenly realms that are as just as much as a reality as the physical realm that we live in, Lord, that we would make known who you are and your wisdom and your incredible love and desire for us as people on this planet to live lives that honor you, that love you, and that love and honor and respect one another. Lord, move us individually and collectively to be the people. We ask for your wisdom. We ask for your understanding. We ask for you to cleanse us, Lord, if there's things in our lives that we need to uh, reveal to you and confess that we would do that, Lord, because we want to walk a in a clean path and in faith in following you and look for you as to where you would have us to be as your people, what you would have us to focus on, our mission. Lord, we're thankful for, for Ryan for the years of service here. We pray for him and Aaron and Josie and Elsie for uh, this time a change in their lives as well as they seek your will in their lives for their family. Lord, we pray for this uh, YMCA, for all the workers, that you would work great and good things and reveal yourself to them and what's in store for them. And we pray for this community. Pray for the people who are members here at the Y, people that just come here just to enjoy the location. We pray for the businesses. Lord, we pray that somehow, in some way, in your ways, 
that they would hear you calling them, that you would bless them. Lord, and you would allow us opportunities in whatever ways to bless others, and especially to be praying for them. We ask for your wisdom and understanding and insight as you prepare a person to come to minister with us. Lord, we ask your hand in that. We know the so many unknowns in the coming days, but we know who you are and that you know all things and that you have plans and purposes, and we're just so amazed at that. Lord, help us to take great trust and confidence and hope in who you are and in your leading and all that you're doing. Lord, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for your spirit. Thank you for your word that's so powerful, so uplifting, encouraging, and convicting in our lives to be the people and the family that you called us to be. Lord, I pray your blessings on each person here today and the ones who are at home, ones who couldn't be with us, Lord, that we would listen for your voice in the coming days, every day. Lord, thank you for being present with us. Through Christ we pray, and the whole church said, amen. You're dismissed.